And now that we have the arrows, we should be able to draw what our next intermediate is You'll going to be. The so the bromine is going to leave, and it's going to have a negative charge. Oh, we formed a new pi bond between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon. And our bulky base has picked up a proton, if you want to draw that too. That's not too important. And here's our counter ion. So it looked like uh, uh, you had drawn the right intermediate here, but it's important to show, to show the mechanism for this reaction as well. This is a really crucial reaction to know the product and the mechanism. All right, but we did get an alkene, which is what we were trying to get here. This is one of the most complicated reactions in the course. It's not surprising that people have trouble with you two because there's three arrows at the same time. Three arrows. How many reactions do we know with three arrows simultaneously? Two different carbons. Um, so what happens is the base takes the proton from the beta carbon. We form a pi bond between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon, and the leading group leaves. How about if this was E1? If it was E1, we'd have the same three arrows. It would just be this would happen first, and then these two would happen second. But it would be the same three arrows just sequentially. If it happened first, what would be forcing it to leave? There would be nothing forcing it to leave in that case. It would be able to leave, though, because it would be leaving behind a stabilized carbocation. That's why E1 only works for tertiary or sometimes secondaries. Theoretically, this um, could do an E1, but we're not going to get an E1 with a very strong base like this. So this is such a strong base, it's not going to wait around until the leaving group leaves on its own. Instead, it's going to force it off. If we had a much weaker base here, it's possible this might go through E1 where the leaving group left first, and then the base came around. But for, for synthesis, E2 is a good way to go. So um, we, uh, all right, so we have E2. We know there's not going to be any SN2 because this is too bulky for that. All right, well, that's a good mechanism. So I was talking about making that piece of paper that has all the key reactions and their mechanisms. Well, um, here's one of the reactions that you'd have on there. Another reaction you should have on there is this E2, and you really do need to know the mechanism for an E2 reaction. Okay, uh, and then what's going to happen next? Uh, well, here we're not going to worry about the mechanism. We're just going to say that ozonolysis um, turns a uh, alkene double bond into two carbonyls. So this is the exact product that we would get at this point. And we've memorized that we need this as the second step for ozonolysis, even though we're not going to learn what this is doing, really. So we're really done. This is, all, this is the work that we would do here. All right. Well, you actually um, worked out a lot of this on your own. You figured out the ozonolysis. You figured out that we needed to do an E2 reaction. The one thing that you didn't do is asking, what do we need in order to do an E2? Well, we need a leaving group before we can do an E2. Um, so there are certain things that you need to look for in synthesis. One thing you look for is breaking carbon-carbon bonds. Because if you can see that you're breaking carbon-carbon bonds, you know it's an ozonolysis. Something else you have to look for is a starting material with no functional groups. If the starting material has no functional groups, you know you're starting with a radical halogenation because you haven't learned anything else you can do with a starting material with no functional groups. I don't think you're ever going to learn anything else you can do, even next semester. So this is what we do. Assuming it's an alkene, though, right? Because well, otherwise, if it's an alkene, then we've lost Then that would be a functional group. Okay. So it's important to oh, realize well, that an organic chemist considers a carbon-carbon double bond to be a functional, a functional group. Got it. Okay. That's right. So if there's no functional groups, it must be an alkane. All right, so um, and half of that you had. You saw that they were cleaving the carbon-carbon bonds. So you thought about ozonolysis. But another trick is look for starting materials with no functional groups. And then you know you're starting with a radical halogenation. And I don't think it was too crucial in this problem, but it's a good idea to try numbering for these problems. Any questions? Is it, um, I was going to say, is it best usually to look at the end and then go backwards? or? Kind of start from the That's an excellent question. Uh, basically, you need to do both, and okay. you need to use your judgment as to what direction to go in. So in this case, we could kind of move in both directions. First of all, we could say, it looks like this came from an ozonolysis. Yeah. But you could also look at this and say, I know I'm starting with a radical halogenation. And then you can try to keep moving until you meet in the middle. Okay. Um, what do we, there's a special name for when we start with the product and try to work backwards. That's called retrosynthesis. Mm -hmm. Retrosynthesis is not a special type of problem. It's just a technique for thinking about multi-step synthesis problems. It's just the technique of focusing on the ultimate product and trying to work backwards to figure out how you were going to produce it. So there's nothing um, mystical about retrosynthesis. It's just what we did here, working backwards. Um, and when you actually do that, what I would recommend is actually working from right to left, the way I did it on the board. What your instructor would do for retrosynthesis Your instructor would like to use a retrosynthesis arrow. 
and work like this, where the starting, where the products are on the left and the intermediates are on the right. But I find that very confusing because I'm used to working from left to right. So I try not to solve problems using these retrosynthesis errors. Instead, I just put the product on the far right, and then I move from right to left when I'm working backwards, because that's the way I'm, I'm used to thinking about these things. Uh, and then if necessary, if the instructor wanted to, you could rewrite it at the end using retrosynthesis. But there's, not, there's nothing, uh, like I said, mysterious about these retrosynthesis errors. They just mean the same thing that we did here with the regular errors going from right to left. Uh, so that was a good question. Should you work from uh, right to left or from left to right? Well, you do whichever one seems more useful. I would say most students focus too much on the starting material and not enough on the product. They don't do enough retrosynthesis because it just feels a little unusual. So it's important to, to really be using both of those approaches. Can I do that one? Oh, I know. Yeah, it looks like the next one. Yeah. Okay. Like By the way, one thing you should do is sure. look at all these little boxes and make sure you know what all these reagents do. do yeah. And that means you have to ask. What starting material do they need to operate on? And then what product would you get? And in most cases, you need to know the mechanism as well. So um, at, at, at earlier here, I was saying that a lot of students have trouble with synthesis because they don't know the basic reactions. But the good news is that wasn't the big problem we had here. You guys actually um, had a pretty good knowledge of the reactions that we needed. You were saying, oh, ozonolysis or E2. So for the most part, you were thinking about the reactions. Maybe not this one so much. Um, so here, it was really a matter of using the right synthesis techniques. I get really confused when it's, do, does, it, does it attack the beta hydrogen or does it attack the leaving group or like that whole, mm -hmm. really throws me, but. Basically, you simply have to learn, that's a matter of just learning the details for each reaction. Each reaction okay. Of course, you also want to ask, why do the details make sense? That makes it easier to remember them and easier to figure out something if you forget it. In this case, it makes sense that this is attacking the hydrogen and not the bromine because we know it's supposed to act like a base and bases take protons. Um, and um, we need to form a bond between the alpha and the beta. So it makes sense that something should happen to the alpha and something should happen to the beta. Well, we already know what's happening to the alpha, the leaving group is leaving. So the thing that's going to happen to the beta is taking the beta proton. So there is a, a, a logic behind what happens in the E2 reaction. So yeah, for each reaction, you just have to learn the details of what's happening and also try to understand why those are logical as much as is possible. Mm -hmm. so it would go for either the hydrogen on the right or to the left of the bromine, it wouldn't go for any of the other hydrogens? That's right. It wouldn't because they're not close enough to a leaving group. Okay. So suppose that we tried to take this hydrogen. Well, if we tried to take this hydrogen, then we would move these electrons here, and that would break the octet rule. This can't gain electrons unless it also loses electrons, but this doesn't have any leaving groups to allow it to lose electrons. Okay. The only reason why alpha carbon here was able to gain these electrons was because we made room for it by having the leaving group leave. So you will get some that are adding to five, I mean that are taking the hydrogen on five, you will get some of that in the lab? I don't think so, because again, there's no weight um, because of this problem right here. No, no, sorry, the one on the other side, I, I called it five based on the top numbers. But it's the same. You mean this number five? Yeah. I think that would be the same problem. If we try to take this hydrogen, there's no place that we can put these electrons because none of the adjacent okay. carbons, maybe you were thinking about carbon six. Mine is, my uh, is on six. six. All right. I'm talking about the hydrogen next to you. That's right. Yeah. No, absolutely, we could attack yeah. either of these two it's beta the carbons. That's right. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. they're equivalent. Okay. <laughs> got it. Just think if you can flip it and it looks the same. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. If there's more than one beta carbon, then there's more than one place the base can attack. In this case, the beta carbons were equivalent, so we didn't need to worry about that issue. Yeah. Okay. Should we take a look at another?